This week in James, we look at first fruits and what happens when those first fruits are not just about something we bring from the garden or the pasture, but they include us and they include everything that God does in us and through us. Let's talk about it. So in case you, in case you forgot, we're in the book of James. Authentic faith. And we're talking about first fruits. We're still in James 16, 1, chapter 1, 16 through 19. Last week we were looking at good gifts. And, you know, our goal isn't the gifts. It's not the fruit. It's the relationship. That's what part of what we talked about. Gifts come because of that relationship. And it's God that matters the most. It's not how many gifts we have or anything else. We're just blessed that God does give us gifts. In fact, we talked about Him being the Father of lights, the giver of all good gifts. And in fact, He says, I'll give you good gifts and I'll give you perfect gifts. And the perfect gifts are different than the good gifts. The good gifts are the things like the apples and the oranges and the blessings that we have right now. The perfect gifts are those that take time to be perfected, to become something amazing. And in fact, some of them, uh, well, all of them really, hinge on Jesus because he is the perfect final gift, the perfect final offering. But there's something surprising about this text. Now, we also are to live lives as gifts. Think about it. Do you see as yourself as a gift to anyone? You say, well, that would be kind of arrogant on my part. If I... Well, it also might be missing a point, right? Because maybe you should be asking yourself, how can I be a gift to someone else? How can I be a blessing to somebody else? Because here's the thing, as strange as it may sound, God thinks you're a gift. You are first fruits. If you come to know Jesus Christ as your Savior, or when you do, you're among the first fruits that we're going to talk about today. If you haven't turned there already, go ahead and turn to uh, the book of James, chapter 1, starting at verse 16. And we'll just review that. Oops, come on. There we go. James 1, 16 through 19. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. This goes back to what was said before. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will he of his own will he brought us forth by the word of the truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. We're going to focus there actually on verse 18 and not go to 19. So one of the things he says here is his own will. We get a lot of confusion. A lot of people who think it's my will that makes all the difference. God's will establishes us. God's will made it possible for us to be in relationship with Him. When we don't understand that, this idea of will often troubles us. It doesn't, you know, if we miss what's going on, if we don't understand what God is doing, because a lot of times we don't, what a surprise, we can really feel badly. We can feel like God abandoned us. But it's not God who's off track, it's us. It's His power that makes us being in relationship with him, possible. That's his own will. He did these things. And we'll talk a couple verses in a minute that reemphasize this. He also brought us forth. That's an interesting phrase. God the Father is the creator of everything. He's the one who planned everything. That includes being a personal creator for us. We were in an accident. He didn't roll some dice and go, oh, well, okay, that looks like a mess, but let's see what happens. He had a perfect plan, which includes you. And you say, really? Because my life has kind of sucked. I can't tell you all the details, but I know God says that he's cared. He has a plan. It includes you. And walking you through this life, God doesn't make junk. The world tells you God made junk. People may tell you that you're not worthwhile. That's not what God says. He says, I love you so much, I'm sending my son to die for you. Even when you're at your messiest, were, are, at your messiest, God loves you. He values you. He created you for a purpose. 
And he prepared a way for you, not just to exist, to even excel in his kingdom once you come to him through Jesus Christ as Savior. He adopts you. In fact, he says we're joint heirs with Jesus when you've submitted to Jesus as your Lord and Savior. I mean, think about simple verses, John 3, 16 and 17. One of the ones I would think of often in this case, though, is also Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10. We're saved not by grace because of something we did, but because we trust in what God has done. It's His grace we're trusting in. And he says in verse 10, for we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. A lot of times we think of what are we going to do? How are we going to change the world? Well, by being in a positive, responsive, submitted relationship with God. You know, we've got some of our graduates last week we rec recognized, Reed and Riley. And they've got those pressures. You may remember them from that age. I have to decide everything about my life, right? It's tough. It's not really true, but it sure feels like that. Well, there's an element every day of I'm deciding my life. For those of you who are old enough to remember the 60s or into the retro, um, today is the first day of the rest of your life was one of those pop psychology phrases you saw a lot of, but there's truth in it. We are making decisions every day, and as first fruits through Jesus, that should influence what we're deciding. Now, if you look here, um, we also see what else do we see? By the word of truth, Jesus is the Word, right? We read in John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That's referring to Jesus. But we also read in John 8.12, I am the light of the world. That light that allows us to see. It's really hard to read in the dark. God sent Jesus there for us to read Him, to see Him, and for Him and His work to be able to see what God is doing. And of course, John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me, Jesus says. That's the truth. That's the word, seeing him lived out. And he lived out that truth of God, 100% man, 100% God, living a sinless life for us to see and to benefit from. And he preached the gospel of truth, that salvation comes through no other. You know, we read in Acts 4, 12, and there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And we read about that here, right? All this stuff in the back, all this Old Testament, is the lead up to the little bit in the tail end of the book. God says, it's coming. I made a way. It's coming. I love my people. I take care of them. The final, final solution is coming. Jesus, the final sacrifice is coming. It didn't say his name always, but it said, I have a Savior coming. And so the New Testament shows us where that made complete, that's again the word of truth that makes it possible. How will they know me if they don't hear, Scripture says. And it was all done according to Father's, God the Father's plan. But wait, there's more. God the Father also preserved this truth, right? Here, not only did he have it happen and we're telling stories, recounting, yeah, I heard Joe said that. No. It was recorded early on. We have fragments even from the first century of Scripture, the New Testament. And we have incredible documents of ancient form for both the Old and the New Testament. It's a very reliable book. His word is here, and it's true. And you can study it from the beginning and the end to see God's consistency and His faithfulness and His mercy and His grace and His patience and even his ultimate justice. And then we're told we should be first fruits. And this is probably where the first readers really perked up. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Remember they were Jews who had come to know the Lord as their Savior. They knew about this first fruits idea. They knew that the first fruits were something that was taken from the harvest. And by the way, it wasn't just a harvest. It was every harvest. So if you had barley here, and a few weeks later, wheat, and you were to take something, the first fruits from every harvest, by the way, according to Deuteronomy. And they also knew that the Hebrew for this idea of first fruits was bikrum, bikrum, which means promise by God, not promised to God. That would be, hey, you owe God this. 
Bikaram is the first reference to first fruits. It says promise by God. God is promising that he will provide for his people. And what he's wanting from them is to them give back to him, recognizing it came from him. And we have things like that today that you see, for example, baby dedications, really. Baby dedications are really parent dedications if they're done right. Recognizing this child is a gift of God's, much like first fruits were done. The thing about first fruits is they were given and they never came back. There was a wave offering. There was a, there could be a, a drink offering, not usually, but there could be. And there was always a sacrifice, typically of a year old male lamb as first fruits. A sacrifice killed for your sins, dead, not coming back, not coming back to your fold. A total commitment to God. That's a hint where God is going to take us as first fruits. A total commitment, right? Completely given away. And that probably registered more with the Jewish Christians in the first century than it does with us today, which is part of why we're spending time on it. They saw the promises and they saw the processes in the Old Testament, and now they're going, wait a minute, now we're the first fruits? What does that mean to us? And let me tell you how that kind of unfolded for many of us. Because he's, it says in 18, of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth. That is, God took counsel with himself and resolved that he was not going to leave sinners in their plight. He knew that before the beginning of time. That's why Jesus would come. He decided to grant them spiritual life by the word of truth. Jesus is that word. And rebirth comes by accepting Jesus as Savior. And the sin is dealt with. It can be forgiven. It's, as God puts it as far away as the east is from the west. He doesn't think of it anymore. And then Peter writes, kind of continuing this idea, because Peter's book would come later, in 1 Peter 1, 23 and 20 through 25, for you have been born again, not of perishable seed. I was going to hold that up. I had a pack of seed, right? Seed, we look at, seeds are dead. You ever see a seed spring up by itself? You open up the package and they pop out of that package? Uh -uh. No, they need something added to them, don't they? They need water and other things added to them. That's Jesus working on us to be born again. But not perishable, but imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. When we say in the beginning, our word is the gospel, our message is the gospel, that's what we're talking about. And it comes through preaching of Christ and his gospel that draws people. Now, throughout history, God's people have seen this. David saw it. Abraham saw it. I have a plan. That's if you can see it. That's on top. There's somebody on their bike headed up. And it's a little bit of an incline. They knew there would be some work towards the goal. And we had this at the beginning when we started, first started James. Then there's the reality of what life really looks like, right? And what we find is that we tend to make some good and some bad decisions. David would make some horrific decisions. He would make some tremendous decisions. The difference was he kept coming back to God, and because of that, God said, you are a man after my own heart. We have that same opportunity to be men and women after God's own heart. It starts all the way at the Garden of Eden. It goes until the end of the world. But we see it time and time again. Remember how we looked at Israel, the example of Israel. God is using Israel as an example, as a people who are his. They were first fruits as well. And the readers of the time, when James first sent this out, would have understood that too. They reviewed that every year with Passover and other celebrations. And he did bring them out of Egypt, and he did care for them. Not because, and why did he pick them as a people? Not because they were mighty, not because they were great, not because they looked better than everybody else, but specifically because they were weak. Crazy reason to pick somebody, right? Unless, of course, you're God, and you want everybody to see it's not this weak people that you picked, 
but your power and your glory being made manifest. That's why God did it. And he doesn't change that plan or that process. As much as we like to think we're the best thing since sliced bread, God says, no, you're my people. And what's he call us? Sheep, right? He loves us and his sheep, my sheep are my voice and they follow me. That's one of the things sheep do really well. But other things, think, thinking deeply and acting wisely, not in the typical sheep you know, itinerary of things to do. And God follows the same plan, in part because people are the same, and so is he. What do we read in Hebrews 13.8? I am the same yesterday, today, and forever. I don't change. But what he also tells us in 1 Corinthians 1.27, I'm going to use the foolish things of this world to confound the wise, so that people see the difference. Specifically, but God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. So we see that with Israel shaming the leadership of Egypt to include God destroying the entire Egyptian army. And we see that in the lives of the early church. And we see that in the lives of today's church where God is at the center where Jesus is actually being followed. You know, we continue to long for things in the world as we step away. Just like the Egyptian, or just like the Israelites did, it's always a struggle between the world, the flesh, the devil, on one hand, and God's kingdom on the other. But God is faithful; He's always there, and He gives us a reminder in His Word, just like He gave the Jews a reminder as they're going through the wilderness, becoming Israel, many of them dying in the desert because they refused to accept God. He gives them the law, right? And this is where we first see. First fruits talked about in Leviticus 23, for example, 10 through 17. And we talked about what the first fruits are. In the Bible, we read about that in Deuteronomy and Leviticus quite a bit. But they're the first product of the field or flock grain, wine, oil, fleeces, the lambs themselves. And there was this process. There was first fruits often were first given right after Passover. But then 50 days later, there was another holiday. Now in Hebrew, it's called. Shavuot. But in Greek, it's called something that you probably remember. What's 50 days after Passover called? Pentecost. Pentecost. And it's all about the festival of weeks. It's one of those three festivals that every male is supposed to go to Jerusalem and celebrate every year. It's one of the big festivals. And it is remembering first fruits. God loves to give us these pictures, doesn't he? Hey, look, a Savior's coming, and I'm providing. A Savior's coming, and I'm providing. Passover comes, Jesus is crucified, he's born again. That's about the time first fruits are given in the temple. And then 50 days later, at Pentecost, we see Jesus ascend. And what do we see? We read it last week in Acts 2. The Holy Spirit comes down. There is that sound, that wind that comes through. There is that flame. And it relates to God's Spirit, which the Jews would have known at the time. But they are first fruits. They're the first fruits of the first fruits. We're going to talk more about that. But the idea is, here are the first fruits. Now, imagine really understanding this. It's hard for us because we don't really understand it. These believers are hearing it for the first time. We're trying to understand now from a distance. They've heard of God working. They've seen the processes and the rituals. And now they're told, you're in the middle of this. You are the first fruits. It was true of them. It's true of you. God is going to give good gifts. He's going to give perfect gifts. But the idea of being a gift to God or being a gift to others is a little different. It's kind of hard to accept for them and for us. In fact, he's perfecting us, that we are a good and perfect gift. Kind of a daunting prospect, don't you think? I mean, you know what a mess you are. And if you don't, you're even more of a mess than you think you are. So, there we are, God working in us. The Jews who have become Christians, the later Gentiles who become Christians, he's doing this. And he's saying, look, I'm keeping my promises. I'm faithful. There are those prophetic messages. I told you it was coming. It was coming. Here's the Passover. Here's the Messiah. 
Here's the good gifts, the perfect gifts I'm giving of salvation and of sanctification so you can be with me in regeneration so there's new life. And I want you to follow in my son's first footsteps, who is the first of the first fruits. He died so that you could live. He's resurrected as a confirmation of that, so you can be resurrected. Follow him. So here we are. Believers and first fruits. And there's a lot we can go to, but I just picked out a few of them, and I encourage you to kind of join in. One of them you probably know well. In John chapter 12, verses 24 through 27, Lazarus has just been raised from the dead, and the Jewish leaders are plotting how to kill him because it's embarrassed them, right? There also, Jesus has come into Jerusalem, and when he's, and this is the victorious entry before Passover, and he's going to have a conversation with some of these believers, and he says in verse 24 of John 12, truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Jesus is confirming this when he raises, is raised from the tomb. And him raising from the dead is that first offering. He's been literally planted in the earth. And he is now brought forth in new life. In that new body, right, that can apparently walk through walls or just appear, but also eats. We see the encounters in Acts chapter 1, I think it is, 2. Um, but now Christ is risen from the dead and he's become the first fruits, we read in 1 Corinthians 15, 20 through 23. For, sons by, for since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. Adam was the first Adam. Jesus was the second Adam. Adam sinned, man fell, sin entered the world and corrupted it. Jesus did not sin. He died for that sin that had been committed. It freed us up to know God and to follow him and to do the works he made for us. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterwards they that are Christ's at his coming. That's 1 Corinthians 15, 20. Through 23. And of course, Paul will then, under the influence of the Holy Spirit, talk in 1 Thessalonians 4.16 about that coming time when Jesus returns as well and the first fruits that are taken up. But remember, it's not, it's the dead in Christ and those who are alive. Those are the first fruits going up. So he uses this a lot. And it's used metaphorically in the New Testament for our new life in Christ, our new life with Christ, where we're indwelt by God the Holy Spirit. We read that in Romans 8, we read that in Romans 15. But James probably has three Old Testament principles touching first fruits in his mind as well. One, all good gifts come from God. That was part of the message of first fruits. That's what we just read in James, wasn't it? All good gifts come from the Father of lights on high. But the Old Testament emphasizes these first fruits were specifically his and were given to him in faith, despite any fear of storm or war or fire or loss. We have these, we give them. I talked to Jason earlier about how people strip the huckleberry bushes of everything so there's no fruit for the future, right? Part of what God is saying is, look, you give up something, it's dead to you, but it brings forth greater fruit. We are dead in sin. We rise in Christ. We are first fruits to him. We're a gift to others. It's kind of amazing, and there's a lot more we can say about it, but... The point is, God is at work, and he's caring for his people, and in faith we are able to reach him through Jesus Christ. Now in James, God's people are told that they are the perfect sacrifice to him too. And Jesus made a way for that to happen. So that's another Old Testament recognition of the New Testament reality of God's work through Jesus. And then finally, the per permanency, that totality of those first fruits. You give them up and they're gone. We die to self, is the phrase that we use from Scripture. We die to self. It's not us anymore, but it's Christ who lives, right? And those who submit to Jesus as Savior and Lord are first fruits, who have been given over 
to God. Now, some of you may get to be saying, well, wait a minute. We are not still first fruits. I mean, I can read where it talks about Corinthians and Galatians being first fruits because they're the first ones. I can see the disciples and the apostles and the early followers in the upper room being first fruits. But come on, 2,000 years later, hasn't the first fruits run out? And the answer is no. God doesn't have grandchildren. God has children. Every child from the time whenever God started this process to today is still God's children. We're still those first fruits in Christ. And remember too, <clears throat> and we may be stretching a metaphorical point a little bit, but you know, we read in scripture, to God a day is a thousand years is a thousand years is as a day. It's been two days since the death and resurrection of Jesus. Why are you in such a rush? Come on. No wonder it feels like God doesn't operate on our time schedule, right? But the point is, God is still at work. And each of us, and those who come after us, just like those who became before us, are first fruits of the redemption work of Jesus Christ. The body of Christ, at large, are the first fruits. All of us, yesterday, today, until God comes again. Each is an irrevocable and permanent offering to God who is called to die to self and take up his or her cross and follow Jesus in living out God the Father's plans where he has made for us works of righteousness, good things, which in large part is us living out a life as gifts to others, just as well as gifts to him. So, you know, as we start to wrap this up, we can remember that God always provides for us. He's always demanded the best from us, but he only gives the best to us. He wants us just to remember that he's the one in charge. He is the lead. He is the provider. He wants us to know that. That he gives good and perfect gifts because he loves us. Because we're special. This is most evident the sacrifice made by God sending his only son to die for us for the corruption and foolishness in which we live that we could be saved from it and the slavery that came with it. And because of Jesus' work it was all possible for us to join in and be joint heirs with him, be first fruits of God in redemption and resurrection. And what's our job? To be in relationship, to look to God, to submit. And when we do things, to do it for his glory, not our glory. So the challenge is most simple and hard. See the victory in him. Be the gift or the victory in him. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you're among God's first fruits. No matter how broken, how helpless, how dirty, how confused, how foolish any of us may be, God sees us as lovely and as desirable and works to transform us through the work of the Holy Spirit. We're among those who are the first and best of his produce. Crazy, huh? I don't know about you, but that's not how I think of myself first and foremost. It's like, wow, I'm the best God has made. Whoa. Maybe what's more accurate is I'm the best God is making. I'm the best me God is making. Because he has a specific job for me and a specific job for each of you. And he didn't make another one just like you. So, honestly, you are the best. But you only become the best if you're in God's hands. If you've been sacrificed to God as real first, fruit, first fruits are. So that promise of God is the real. So we can give ourselves to him as the only thing of value we have, but he's given us the gift of the Holy Spirit to work in us through these trials that we're supposed to find joy in and using these gifts that he gives us to know his faithful love and care for us. This is a quote from somebody. As followers of Christ, we can take comfort in knowing that no matter what struggles we may encounter, we have victory through him who has overcome the world. So let us lift our heads high knowing that God is with us every step of the way. With his strength and guidance, we can face whatever challenges come our way, confident that he will carry us through to victory because we are his first fruits. God is good. Father, thank you. May we know better how much you love us. May we know better that we are the best us we can ever be by being the first fruits given to you. 
by submitting to you and following you through Jesus. Help us to know, Father. We see poorly, we hear poorly, we typically act poorly. But as you work, we know that the fruits of the Spirit are made obvious in our lives. May we be a gift to you and to others, and may you receive the glory and honor. Thank you for the love that you show us, Father. May you guard and guide, we pray, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Like so much of God's work in our life, it's so easy, it's hard. What does this mean? How do I live it out? And who am I to even imagine that God cares for me, loves me, is perfecting me? If you have questions, comments, concerns, giving, prayer requests, whatever, you can reach us here. We look forward to hearing from you. We're praying for you, that God may bless and direct you. Would you pray for us?